You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. What's up my fellow zoo nerds, zoo travelers, and casual travelers looking for their next adventure? You're watching one of our newer series. Our regularly scheduled programming explores a zoo one section at a time. This video will break down everything at once and show all of the fun things that you and your family can do at Zoo Miami. To get you started, if you want an optimal visit, you gotta grab yourself a Johnny, who's really become the heart and soul of this channel lately for providing footage and other ways that I don't have time to say. So please thank him by subscribing to his channel and also mine as well. The park formerly known as the Miami Metro Zoo was officially born in 1980. 40 something years later, it's home to 3,000 animals from 500 species, not including the plethora of invasive lizards that roam around the grounds. You know, out of everything, honestly, they were probably the most entertaining part of my trip. They're, they're pretty good at physical comedy. They all have free range of the zoo's 750 acres. Only 324 of it is actually developed, but that's still three times larger than San Diego and 59 acres larger than the Bronx. So prepare to walk about four miles if you wanna see every little bit of this place. Don't feel like traveling on foot? The zoo offers multi-seated safari cycles that you can rent for a few hours. No matter how in shape you think you are, you'll want one. If you wanna get past these gates as of 2023, adults have to fork over around $23. Children three through 12 have to come up with 1895. And if you're under that, lucky for you, you get a no charge. Though I don't recommend it, if you're someone or know someone who's obsessed with flamingos, you can spend your entire zoo day with these pink birds without actually even walking in the main zoo. When that ticket is scanned, you're gonna stop right there. Not only can you study the map, but you also get a list of who or what is absent for the day. Or you can go to the Know Before You Go page on their website, which is awesome because very few zoos do this. Some of your first steps will take you into the Mission Everglades, one of the ultimate representations of a very specific wildlife region. Animal-wise, there's probably nothing that you haven't heard of. However, the amount of times I've gotten the cold shoulder or no-shows from all of these at other parks made this exhibit even better because I saw every single species active at some point. It's one of the newest areas in the zoo, and don't hate me for saying this, but for $33 million, it should have been a little better. It looks kind of rough. There's a lot of uh, slices of cheese and its immersion is nowhere near the same league as the oldest parts of the zoo. I'm ripping on it, but you'll still have so much fun. There's a crawl through tree trunk that takes you into bear territory. A slide that takes you underwater with the otters. And you can tell your friends that you crawled under a massive crocodile. And for $5 a person, you can coast through the Lost Man's River. It winds through the middle of the attraction on a faux fan boat. It was only about seven minutes, but let me tell you, it was so peaceful. I could have, well actually, I almost fell asleep. And after a very long day, that alone made it worth the five bucks. If you have a kid or are a kid that loves flashing lights and punching buttons or likes to learn about animals or both, the Conservation Action Center was made for you. In many of its own really weird ways, it's probably the most unique part of the zoo. There's displays about local wildlife, displays warning you about invasive wildlife, educational games about uh, mating and how poop doesn't go to waste at the zoo. And there were a bunch of animals, but everything was off display apparently for privacy reasons. When you're looking through the map, you might notice the Australian Center doesn't have a whole lot of emphasis. And when I got there, I could see why. It's not like what we're used to. See the card above. There's no theming, it's small, and it felt more like a behind the scenes area. However, the collection, though also small, is about as interesting as an Australian exhibit can get. Now I'm gonna stop right there because this will be in a two part series that's coming to the channel real soon. Leading up to the next main area is a beautiful island for lemurs, a giant, giant tortoise yard, and one, two, three, and four kinds of swine. 
Again, something you don't see at the average zoo. The exhibits are shady, muddy, and better reflect what the zoo is all about. But first, Amazon and beyond is, <laughs> wow. Remember a few weeks ago when I claimed we just saw America's best South America exhibit? I want to formally apologize because I think I was wrong. It is nearly a half mile hike through seven and a half acres of a completely isolated tropical rainforest split into three different regions that without a doubt could be their very own standalone exhibit. Amazon and beyond not only has the classics that's in nearly every South America zone, but the designers found ways to keep it interesting with every turn. It has its own aquarium of giants, a chance for jaguars to walk right above you with complimentary, obstructive, but natural looking bamboo viewing. And as if it wasn't cool enough for the zoo just to have harpy eagles, they took one step further and gave the birds the opportunity to also fly over the guest path. There's giant otters, their own giant crocodiles, these awesome things again, a physical model of the entire attraction. But you know what my favorite thing about this was? The random scatter of terrariums in all three sections for lizards, snakes, frogs, and crocodile hatchlings. I really wish we didn't just tour a South American exhibit because otherwise this would be our next feature. I know it doesn't seem like it makes sense to backtrack all the way over here, but it does when you don't want to end this video in Australia. Anyways, <clears throat> do you like moats? Do you like it when barriers are invisible? And when an animal is given so much space, even when that animal is small? Well, Miami's got over 30 of them, even with the more traditional exhibits on the other side of the park. These moats are what zoo enthusiasts think of when they think of Zoo Miami. And I'm pretty sure most of them have been nearly untouched since 1980. And they're so convincing that on several occasions, you wouldn't even know that there's exhibits behind exhibits. And when the residents are in the same ground level as yours, with no obstruction, it makes these a photographer's paradise. And I can't really explain it, but it makes the animals look so much bigger, especially the elephants and the giraffes. Asia and Africa are connected by one two mile path, but they are interrupted a few times after the impressive tiger temple, sloth bears, tapers, and more is the wings of Asia. A one and one quarter acre walk through aviary. From what I've heard, it's the most impressive part of the zoo and maybe even the greatest aviary in America. So why am I not using my own footage? Well, that's because it just had to be closed on my visit, but that's okay. They were renovating it to add, I believe a permanent Kiwi exhibit. And that alone is a reason to come back. The Critter Connection is essentially the children's zoo. You and your quiet little ones can eat, high five a meerkat through glass, hit up a petting zoo and climb on a camel. Now with the wings of Asia closed by default, my favorite interruption is the Asian river life. It's small, it's two stories, and it encourages clotted leopards to hang out on the canopy. And if you like small clawed otters, they got small clawed otters. Now stairs are supposed to take you to meet the cats and the otters in the lower level, but it looked like it was flooded. Not sure why we weren't allowed to go down there. After all, it's called the Asian river life, uh huh. Right around your encounter with the Komodo dragons is where Africa and Asia actually meet. Asia is on the left, Africa is on the right. Now it sounds like it wouldn't work, and mixing these animals together is really uneducational. But every individual habitat is so far away and secluded from the rest, they don't really intertwine. Both sides are a species list hunter's dream. Asia has one of America's few doles, bantangs, a bantang baby, a noah's, and Indian Gower. Africa has sable antelope, black dikers, endangered hardy mammals of the desert, again, and their babies, and I believe the only giant eland in a traditional American zoo. Oh, and I saw a cat where gibbons were supposed to be, so that was pretty cool. Despite all the walking you have to do around this area, I loved it. Now wait a minute, didn't I just criticize Detroit for having a similar setup? Yes I did. But there's a difference, it's true. These 30 plus moated displays are virtually all the same. And other than the temple, there's really no theatrics, theming, or anything to make it a little more interesting, like Detroit. However, to 
keep it short. Detroit doesn't use moats, they use regular fencing, and therefore Miami has a leg up in immersion. I never struggle to find a single animal in Miami. Well, I know of Michigan locals who have never seen certain creatures in Detroit, and I don't mind walking good distances between habitats to essentially see the same exhibit over and over when I know I'm going to be looking at some of the rarest creatures you'll find in a zoo. Zoo Miami felt very different from any other place I've been to. It has a perfect balance of new and things that are decades old, but nothing felt too outdated. I don't recall there being a time where I thought, oh, that poor animal. The marsupial section needs a little work. The great apes need a little bit more forest and the jaguars could use an expansion. I know how much elephants care about interior design, but there really are better ways of keeping them going anywhere near trees but overall the positives outweigh the negatives by tons and tons. I cannot wait to go back and you should book a flight just to go there too. You're probably wondering where does it rank on my favorites list? It's definitely in my top 10 and leave it at that. If you have any questions about Zoo Miami and my visit, I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability. Locals, if I missed anything, please do not be afraid to say it. And as usual, stay tuned and thank you all for watching Zoo Tours.